Breathing in diesel exhaust fumes is like walking into a fire without a mask. Over time, those toxins lead to cancer. Protect yourself with MagnaGrip the easiest, most reliable exhaust removal system that features a true 100% seal to eliminate diesel exhaust fumes. To get free grant assistance, visit magnagrip.com. IFSTA is dedicated to advancing firefighting techniques and safety through the creation of our manuals, instructor resources, and student study materials. Our high quality, technically accurate, and affordable training content has made us a fire service leader. Visit us at ifsta.org for more information. And good evening. We're here for another episode of the Larry Conley Radio Show. I don't know why I called it a radio show. When we first started out, it sounded like radio, but now we're doing podcasts and got people and all that. You just used to just listen to it, but now uh, we got faces in the place. And uh, so, but nostalgically, at least I still like to call it the radio show because I had to face radio. I just want to live that dream out with a among some other dreams. That's why I got the uh, cool old school microphone here. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and uh, you got the Dr. Dre beats on, so it's, it's got the whole radio feel to it. So it's kind of cool. Um, uh, tonight we're uh, we, we do, we're minus the glue crew with uh, Mommy Lane and David, but um, we're gonna get through it anyway. I got the I got my other crew, the crew I work with. Um, in, in Engine House 13 for a long time, back when I was uh, a St. Louis firefighter. And um, we're here to talk about a subject tonight that is going to be probably a little thick to get through, but it's necessary to normalize these type of conversations. Um, at the beginning, you probably saw the uh, what we're dedicating this particular production to is to our fallen brother, um, Firefighter Benjamin Paulson, who left us on January the 13th, 2022. And um, and so the crew went through it, still going through it. And, um, and it's going to be a lifelong thing. It's just going to get easier as it goes along. But we'll never forget um, this, is, this is our 9-11 moment, so to speak. Um, you read about... Um, Firefighters dying all the time because when you raise your hand to take that oath, it's kind of part of what you signed up for, unfortunately. And uh, so, with that being the case, we we signed up for that, uh, being unfortunately paid the ultimate price with that. And um, you read about p- other people, and you say, "Oh man, that's really bad. I feel really bad for him. I'm praying for him generically because we're all in the family and all in the business." No matter what part of the world their firefighters are in, we're all in the same family. However, when it happens to you, on your crew and your team, it definitely hits different. It definitely hits different, and uh, this really hit all of us different. We were all at different vantage points. We'll talk about that. But the main thing tonight, even though being is going to be the backdrop of the conversation. The main thing we want to talk about today is our is healing, the stages of healing, uh, the proper direction to go with healing. We're not trying to have all the answers tonight and say that, you know, because you listen to the show, you know how to heal because it's a constant work, um, but it's very necessary to do it. We want to normalize the conversation and um, the conversation is not necessarily normalized because uh, firefighters and policemen and, you know, every other person who has a dangerous job protecting people, we're supposed to not have any feelings, uh, uh, man up, woman up, <laughs> but just get the job done without no acknowledgement to your mental fitness. <laughs> and just like we got physical fitness, we definitely need our mental fitness to be just taken as serious as our physical fitness. Uh, a lot of times when physical fitness happens, here's what we do. 
we break an arm. We say, ooh, my arm broke. So what do you do? You go to the emergency room and you get a cast and you get all that. Now, realistically speaking, if you don't do anything about your arm, it's eventually going to stop hurting one day. It's just going to grow funny. It's going to be deformed. It's not going to be functioning to its best to the best of its ability. But when it comes to our mental fitness, we don't think about that. We don't think about being broken because you don't really see it. So you can walk around and people don't know your mind is broken, but it's never going to operate the same if you don't do the things to heal it. And that's what we want to talk about tonight is making that parallel between just like you would go fix a broken arm or broken leg or something you could see or you deem dysfunctional, um, the same thing needs to happen um, with the mental because you wouldn't dream of not getting a limb repaired, but we kind of a little slow on getting the brain repaired and we want to normalize that conversation. And so us as still, they my family still is Engine 13, uh, we still want to continue to heal from it. The St. Louis Fire Department as a whole took a loss. It's not just us. We just took the loss because it was our our family member. But uh, ben, uh, ben, was, ben was a great addition. So I kind of started off with, um, you know, the story, if you will, because we know Ben, but you guys didn't. And um, first of all, let me introduce everybody. And then we'll uh, kind of get the story started and everybody's going to kind of chime in. And that's how the story is going to go. So um, the young lady on here, uh, she was uh, Miss North St. Louis for five years running. Um, no. <laughs> Miss Hood, North St. No, no, she didn't win that for real. But uh, uh, <laughs> but April Casey is on and she's going to talk to us. She's, she's head of a uh, foundation initiative called Rebound 911. Uh, April was a um, retired uh, cop police officer, and she's doing a lot of things to help um, police officers with their mental fitness. And, and it's a great resource for making those connections that when somebody's going through something that they would see, and I don't know what to do, who to turn to, she knows how to uh, put steer them in the right direction. She's definitely has driven the miles and used to, kept some strange hours helping people in the in, in her profession and uh, so we're trying to make it one big collective in the firefighters and the police department um the pretty boy we got up here is uh with the you don't be smiling think i'm talking about you i was talking about gala no nah. <laughs> but uh, but anyway it's uh uh Devante saunders and uh, uh uh, Devante has been family for a long time. I've been knowing Devante since he was like five or six years old. And, uh, you know, and uh, so his mom has been, his mom is a, a St. Louis City firefighter. She's been on for a while. I did my part to help her get on the job. And uh, Devante got old enough and she's like, help my baby. I was like, well, how much do you want me now? <laughs> but seriously, uh, she, uh, uh, we have Devante. And Devontae is a great asset to the 13s and St. Louis Fire Department. Very talented brother there. And is going to be going places in the fire fire service. And in this first five years, has seen what uh, probably more, but what more people have seen in their, some of their whole careers, you know, just because of the assignment and some of the things we've been through. So um, that's Devontae. And uh, almost ready to be bachelor of the year, but he got locked down. So he's, He's good. He's good, you know. And then we got uh, uh, the the white guy on the on the on the call, and uh, my boy <laughs> Tyler Johnson. And uh, Tyler, uh, man, what can I say about Tyler? Tyler came. I didn't want Tyler at the first. You know, he came kind of. They forced him on me. He's like, "You got to take this guy." I was like, "You know what? Why? 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 I'm happy with my crew. Why? Why? You know." So anyway, I kind of looked at Tyler with the side eye when he first came to the 13th. But let me tell you, he was a he was a great addition. He's he's the comic relief of the crew. Uh, really kept us laughing on our toes, and just has a a unique talent to not only make you laugh, but can create things to back it up, whether it be a meme or a poster or something creative he can do on his phone. And um, and those of you probably seen my uh, video productions for. FDIC submissions in the last few years, 
that's basically uh, put together by uh, Tyler Johnson here. He's, he's, he's got skills. He kind of missed his calling. So he's a, a creative uh, soul who just happened to be a firefighter. So uh, so that's uh, I, I got Tyler Johnson. And then uh, we got my assassin, the right-hand man, um, Galen. And uh, Galen been through thick and thin. I know him when he was thin, and I know him where he stick. So uh, we've been through thick and thin together. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, but anyway, <laughs> but me and Galen, uh, we grew up in the same neighborhood. Didn't realize we did. We, we man, you you used to go over there too. I used to do this and whatever. Uh, so, um, but we we know the 13th area because we grew up there over there. And he's been a great senior man on the job and. We call him kind of mother hen of things. Galen's going to take care of everything, hug everybody, conscientious about um, different things. And, and he was the kind of person that kind of gave you the orientation. I'll tell you what I need to tell you when you knew at the 13th, then I'll say, go see Galen. And Galen would be like, do this, do this, don't ever do that. And if you do that, then, you know, I'm, I'm going to help Larry get you out of here. And that's, you know, that's how it was. And then the last but not least is Galen's. Uh, brother Kyle and Kyle is, I think Kyle is like the the uh, the highest ranking officer in in the service in, in military right there. You know, just uh, if you don't, if you don't know, you gonna you know, I think you know, they got a poster of him in D.C. Like I'm the guy, you know. But he hails from St. Louis as well and has done well for himself. And uh, also as a chaplain, the spiritual the spiritual moral compass in in the world that really needs it and and in the military and things like that so he's going to be chiming in from his perspective on um uh, on that as well because we're all in the business of of keeping people safe keeping things safe uh, but we need we, we we humans we need we need help for the long haul you know so that's how you got on the on the on the call today on the show today and we're just gonna uh, kind of talk and get through it it might be a little thick. I've been actually, I've been kind of anxious about this. I was sitting at work talking about you know, why did I come up with this idea? <laughs> so, and uh, for the show, so I've, I've been a little anxious about it, but I'm glad we're doing it now because during the time when being passed, it seemed like everybody and their mama was had some kind of being posting this and being posting that. I'm just like, that's our brother. What y'all capitalize on our stuff now? How you spell posting? I bet you don't know, do you? You know, so it's just everybody was just, you know, into it. And and I'm not taking away from it, it was great. Uh, the attention was great and all that. But I think for us who were mourning, it was a lot all at one time. You know, we had to deal with our mourning of it. And then we had to deal with kind of uh, being courteous and being the face of people when they want to show up and do things and be there for you you kind of like i kind of want to be quiet like now nah, we want to talk about being so you feel kind of obligated to serve uh, the curiosity or serve uh, what people wanted to help with and that can be that can be kind of weird to break down you know if you anybody's ever been to a family death you don't mind everybody bringing the, the fried chicken and all that about the wow you just want everybody out your damn house <laughs> because it's a lot to take in and it's a lot of stuff just snapping and with that being a lot i know for me i just sometimes felt overwhelmed and even dealing with it you know i didn't want to have another being post and conversation not because i didn't love being but it was just you don't realize being us it was a, we already dealing with our own processes of it and then on top of that you have to facilitate other people's um, investment, if you will, whatever the word is, to the whole thing. So it was it was just a lot at one time. And I don't know how these guys felt. That's how I felt about it, you know. Um, but Ben was part of our family, came to the 13s. Uh, when he got assigned to the 13s, we were like, okay, let's see what we got here, you know. Now, I knew Ben's father. Ben's father's on the job, Captain James Polson. He uh, retired as a fire captain from the job. James is a great guy, and this was a um, family business. Uh, ben could have been anything he wanted to be. Ben was, a, you know, he could have been an attorney because he graduated from law school. He attorney, firefighter. He was a ski instructor out in, in Colorado, 
and came back here to to take do the family business. And um, so when he came to the 13th, um, I felt some responsibility in the sense that um, over the years I've had, um, you know, some some people's children who have been assigned. You know, remember we had uh, Stu, <laughs> uh, Devante, we got, uh, uh, you know, Ben, you know, we just, and not to mention doing these countless recruit classes I've done, then there, there are people who, you know, they're, their children come through the recruit class. So you feel this kind of connection, like I'm here to protect them, you know, and thanks for entrusting me. And I can't help but feel some kind of way that um, that this happened to Ben. But Ben came to us and we kind of laid down the law of, of how we get down at the 13s. And, and of course I talked to him and then go see the assassin, go see Galen. And then Galen talked to him and we let them know that we're a community-based house. And uh, we got the doors open. We don't uh, drive in from um, from God's country to you know work on our boats and all that kind of stuff. You know, uh, we 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 come in. We got the doors open. We part of the neighborhood. Uh, we part of the, and 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 for the most part, all of the other two crews were had their uh, versions of the same thing. Everybody was you know the thirteens doors was open. The kids come in. We help them with their homework. We we do whatever to involve the community because it's a safe place and that's how it should be. So if we put the whole being, that's the kind of family that you are coming into. And man, he, he, he assimilated real quick. I mean, he, he, uh, being know how to crit walk and maybe for most of you in the audience don't know what crit walking is. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, look it up. You can Google everything. I'm not going to try to do it for you. Uh, cause I'm trying to save my hips, but, uh, you gotta, you know, the crit walk or something that, uh, the, the neighborhood kids know how to do and being get out there and show them what's up. They like, well, wait a minute. This, <laughs> this white boy can crit walk, man. Look at this. You know? So it was just funny to, you know, but he'd get out there and throw the ball around with him and, uh, you know, and, and talk to him just like we did, but it didn't take him long. He wasn't shy about it. He, he came right into the family and became the uh, uh, part of the neighborhood. And a matter of fact, the street now, we we uh, we worked hard to make the street, uh, get the street renamed Ben Post and Place. So where the kids continue to play now, where they play with Ben, they're always going to play with Ben because that 1400 block of Charmant Avenue is now Ben Post and Place. And uh, so we're very glad to have helped. Uh, make that legacy happen, but he was part of the family. He, uh, you know, we, we got uh, you show. Uh, Galen had a great picture of him with his helmet. Is when we finally gave him his own shield because we had custom shields made for the thirteen. So we finally gave him his own shield. He was like, "Man, I'm in now." He was like, "Yeah, you know, all we gotta do is teach you to seek your handshake now. You be in there, you know." And, and so. Uh, so he became part of the family, and, and, and we was glad that there was not a lot of pushback on, on how we get down at the, at the firehouse. Um, so the uh, so he had only been there, um, I forget how long, but, you know, a short time before we really started getting, you know, some, some good work. And then um, the fateful day of January 13th happened, 2022. Yeah, so right now I'm going to kind of um, kind of get everybody's viewpoint on this. Me personally, I was down in Pensacola, Florida, and there's a, um, a um, conference down there with um, Kurt Igerson, Chief Igerson, and uh, I was down there trying to, like I always do, go places, try to learn how to do better in my craft, and I was there and um, got the call from my PIO, Gary Mosby, who uh, let me know that um, we uh, two people from the 13s were trapped in the building. And then I think uh, I think my next call was from Galen. And, uh, and um, I know Galen was at a class as well. So anyway, when that all went down, um, I just kept monitoring things because one thing about it, we I'm not saying it happens all the time, but often you know, somebody got lost or trapped in the building and they, we get them out. This is how it is. We just 
after we figure out they're okay, then we tease them about it and you're on to the next call, so to speak. But this hit a little different because it wasn't as automatic as everybody got out. So the next call I got from uh, our PIO was like, uh, uh, you got Tyler, but uh, Ben didn't make it. And um, that just, just froze everything. Then I get a call from Galen and um, with the same uh, bad news. Um, so at that point, I couldn't concentrate on the conference. And I was like, oh, okay, well, I'll take care of when I get back to St. Louis and head back into the conference. That wasn't, you know, that wasn't the, the game. I was, I was spent. I was shut down. I couldn't think straight. And um, luckily, the it's a great group of firefighters and leaders that were down there speaking. Um, they they sequestered me to a room. Uh, Ray McCormick, you probably know him from. From all his, uh, he's famous for teaching how the best way to advance hose lands and things of that sort. And Ray was like, "I'm not gonna leave you. I'm gonna stay here, and uh, until um, until we uh, then uh, Jessica Jackson, she was at the conference as well. So we just all kind of hung out. And after the conference, they were all the speakers were were ready to go grab something to eat and had other plans and changed their plans and had an impromptu um, dinner, fire firehouse dinner, fire around the kitchen table kind of dinner in the hotel suite. And everybody just brought food and we just had a very supportive potluck dinner. And uh, one of the guys' wives worked for the airline or something and was able to get me back the next day. So I, um, I flew back, Jessica flew back and we got back. Um, um, and um, Galen picked me up from the airport and I just like, hey, take me straight to the site because I wasn't going to believe it until he's like one of the things you'd be like, I got this got to be a bad dream, you know, and um, went there and it was it was real. And um, so from there, everything just kind of went the way it went. I knew I was going to have to deal with that pain. I knew I was going to have to go back to work. I knew I was going to have to do the funeral. I knew I was going to have to do all that. And selfishly, I just did not want to go through all of that. It was just a hard thing to do and deal with, but um, it's got to be done, you know. So that was my vantage point, feeling very helpless, um, uh, feeling what you know, you always think, what if, what if I'd been there? What you know, it's it's a lot of what ifs, you know. And uh and right now this this whole thing is not to get into the details of all that. This whole thing is that happened. We are talking about how to heal and how to continue to heal, and that's the focus of tonight's conversation. But I just want to go around. I mean, I'll start with um um Galen and then we'll talk to uh, Devontae and Tyler and get their vantage point as well, because they was at ground zero. Um, Galen and I were a little more removed, but still the, you know, we the, we the uncle and the daddy of the crew. So, you know, <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, Galen, what was your, um, well, tell us about your uh, vantage point that day. Well, on our department, you know, when the uh, captain is off duty, usually the senior guy steps in and uh, we call it riding the seat or you're the acting captain for the day. So that was my responsibility that day. Um, I uh, had gotten pulled off the crew, though, for four hours that morning to uh, go take a class on some potential equipment that we were thinking about purchasing as a department. So it was me, and I believe it was like seven other guys out of our district uh, got pulled you know, out for this class. And it was probably about 45 minutes to an hour away. So we were a little ways away. Um, we're sitting in class, going along. And uh, we have this app called Active 911. On our phones, all our runs come up. Uh, I didn't I didn't turn it off and uh, while I was in class and my, my active went off uh, for a building fire. And when I saw the address, I knew it was our fire first in. Uh, I didn't have my radio on, or at least I couldn't turn it on because, you know, we're in class or whatever. So 
I was like, oh, my God's got something, you know, I'm sitting there thinking, yeah, they got something. And uh, just about, you know, when I get back, they'll tell me the story of uh, what happened. So anyway, class is going on and uh, <clears throat> I get a, I get a, my phone starts blowing up, but it's from the guy sitting across the room from me. Um, and uh, I think one of the messages I read said that uh, there's a mayday at the Cope Brilliant fire. And uh, when I saw that, I jumped up out of my seat and ran out into the hallway and uh, jumped on with dispatch because <clears throat> I didn't, you know, my radio wasn't picking up down there. So I jumped on the phone with dispatch and I asked them what was going on. I said, I'm, I'm at a class. My crew's at this fire and I just heard there's a mayday. I said, what's going on? They didn't want to tell me too much. Uh, they just told me we had a building collapse and we got two firefighters on the counter for it. So I hung up the phone. I ran into the room and I yelled. I interrupted the instructors. I just yelled out, we got to go now. And uh, everybody jumped up immediately and started heading out. Uh, we all jumped in our cars and we headed up the highway. That was when I called you and let you know what was going on. Uh, not knowing that you already knew, but you know, just, just like you said, you know, we always get them out. I was, I had a, <clears throat> I had a thousand uh, thoughts racing through my mind, and one of them, the the main one, I'd say that was uh, the majority of them was like I didn't know who it was, uh, but when I when I heard who it was, I was like, they're they're I'm gonna get there, <clears throat> they're gonna be in the back of the ambulance getting their bumps and bruises treated and. I'll punch him in the shoulder or something and, you know, give him some, some, some shit about it. And, you know, we'll, we'll go on back to work and finish up our day or whatever. So, um, as we're getting closer to St. Louis, we're starting to pick up more radio traffic. And for the time that passed, we would have thought we would have been hearing more positive things than we weren't. So we stepped on it even more. Um, when we got to the city, I had a guy with me, Jake Newman. Uh, we stopped by his house, and grabbed his gear, stopped by my house, and we grabbed my gear because we knew we would be going to work when we got there. And we pulled up, still not, like you said, not believing this is what was going on. We're thinking we would be getting there and helping pick up line or something. You know, um, and I think the first person as I stopped, I got uh, greeted by was a fuel truck driver. and He had this real somber look on his face. Um, he asked me if I was OK, and I'm like, why is he asking me if I'm OK? So then, of course, I started like double timing it up the street to the scene. Uh, I ran into a couple other people. I don't even remember who it was. Uh, and I asked where Tyler and Ben were. And uh, the first person told me, the first person told me Tyler's gone. And that's exactly how they said it. They said Tyler's gone. And my heart sank. Like I froze. And I didn't know what to do. So it seemed like it seemed like hours, but it was probably literally seconds. And I snapped out of it and I asked, well, where's Ben? And they said, well, Ben's in the ambulance. The ambulance was right there next to me in front of the house. So, of course, I ran over to the ambulance and jumped in the ambulance and, and I saw Ben. And, uh, I lost it. I lost it. And uh, I came stumbling out and I think Elizabeth grabbed me and uh, helped me up. And I was like, where's Tyler? Where is Tyler? 
and they were like, he's, he's gone to the hospital. So I ran and found my chief. I checked in. I let him know I was here. I let him know I wasn't staying. I was going to see Tyler. Uh, I asked where Devontae was. I didn't forget about you, Devontae. I asked where Devontae was, but they told me you were okay. They told me you were down there in the command post uh, getting debriefed. So instead of waiting around because I didn't know how I was going to take, I ran back to my car and got in my car and drove to the hospital and went and found Tyler. And uh, definitely, you know, we embraced when I walked in the room and, uh, you know, I, uh, I, 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 I really kicked in the mother hand mode then because then I was like, I need to, I need to call his family. I don't know that the fire department made any of these notifications. I need to call his family so they know he's okay. I got to hold his mom, not his wife. And I got her coming down there to be with him. And, uh, I stayed with him mostly the rest of the day. I drove them back to uh, the firehouse, and uh, I want to say a lot of people, a lot of people, a lot of our our union uh, brothers and sisters came over and uh, brought us food, uh, you know, talked to us if we needed to talk, uh, basically just there to support us in every way that they could. and. yeah, that's that's where, you know, Tyler and his wife went home. And then from there, I had the I didn't have two. We were all definitely we were all told to go home. We were told we're going home no matter what. And uh, I felt obligated to pack, pack up being stuff for his family. And, uh, you know, I knew nobody was going to be able to come get his car that night. So I pulled his car in the gated lot. So, you know. It, whenever they came, it would be there and it would be safe, you know, in a locked up lot. So, uh, that was, so that was, uh, you know, I, uh, my wife, my wife got called. She showed up to the hospital. And, uh, I, now that I think about it, you know, now, uh, I wasn't thinking about it then. I was probably kind of an asshole to her. Not like I wasn't cussing or yelling at her, but, my focus was on my guys and her focus was on me and I was definitely shutting her out. <clears throat> uh, not that, not that she's not important to me and I don't depend on her, but whenever I go through something at work, my first phone call is always to my brother. And uh, that's who helped through the majority of, you know, my issues or whatever. So I know I was on the phone with him that day and uh yeah so that was my day Mm -hmm. tyler and Devontae, you guys were ground zero so um you know i'm not saying you gotta get super deep because i know it's um not an easy thing to relive but you know but you know share what you want to share as far as you know your what you was what happened with you that day or whatever. You can go ahead since you, uh, since do you, you would said you like to go first? <laughs> uh, that day I was driving. I remember the first call in the morning was a commercial alarm on Devala and Del Mar. Uh, we were a normal day, you know, uh, come in, check the truck, call the fuel truck, check uh, water, check tools, you know, just basic morning routines, normal day. Um, first call was the Del Mar and Devolver commercial alarm. And as we're, you know, got everything, the system reset, we start headed back to quarters. And we're about two blocks away from quarters, we notice a uh, little smoke coming from the west of, the fire, west of uh, our firehouse. So, like like any other fire company, we decided to investigate uh, as we get maybe a block away from where the smoke was actually coming from. Uh, the call went out, fire in the building uh, as we turned on the street. 
So we pull up uh, and we start coming up with a plan. Uh, one of the neighbors approached us. There's a, a guy that, that stays here. I believe he's still in there, you know. So Tyler and Ben go into offensive stance uh, in an attempt to, you know, get this guy out. Um, uh, in, in that moment, you know, uh, it, it happened so quick. Uh, those guys were in, 28s were pulling up, and you just kind of hear a, a loud, you know, thud almost. And, uh, you know, you just see a big cloud of dust just come from the building. Uh, 28s hop out, uh, go to the line. I guess they start pulling the line. Tyler, they pull Tyler out. And, uh, you know, it was kind of – everybody just was – trying to figure out where Ben was. Uh, after a while, once we, we, we got Ben out, uh, you know, I just couldn't believe, you know, it was, it was just so so real, you know. I, it was like, like you said earlier, it was like a dream. I was like, I couldn't believe this was happening. Um, they pulled us, pulled me and uh, Zach Potts, because he was riding a plug that day. They pulled us aside at, in the command post, you know, spoke with us. Um, Tyler and Ben, you know, were uh, transported to the hospital. After I spoke with uh, CFD and uh, 800, and they said, hey, go home, take take the rest of the day off. Uh, I'd immediately pack my stuff up and uh, went to the hospital to check on, you know, Tyler and uh, just to make sure he was good. Um, after that, I, I went home and just took time to uh, – Oh, good. Excuse me. Sorry. <laughs> Took the time to, you know, appreciate uh excuse. Just took the time to mm-hmm. appreciate my family, my kids, you know. Oh, good. Tyler, what about you? Yeah. Yeah, uh, so, uh, I mean, it started off like a normal day, like pretty much, you know, every other day, and Galen was out, so I was right in the seat that day. Um. Me and Ben were in the kitchen and had some popcorn, shared shared a bag of popcorn with them and watching a movie and talking about how terrible it was, you know, joking around and hanging out and, uh, you know, we, we got a call for a commercial fire alarm and we had all gotten in, in the truck and went to it. And then on our way back, I, we were going to go to the gas station because Potts was the guy that was riding with us. He was um, on the plug that day. Um, you know, he wanted to to stop and get a drink. And that's when we kind of noticed that there was smoke. Um, and at first I thought it was, you know, it was Spire down the street, you know, doing their burn. They So they, you know, down the street they do these live burns and they burn oil and all sorts of stuff in these pits and it makes these really large smoke clouds and so that it's not unnormal you know to see the big smoke clouds and and yeah at first you think it's a fire but you know it's usually not it's usually just you know spire running some tests on their foam or whatever and so at first i thought that's what it was but then when we got to the gas station i was like i don't know because it's it's more north of where spire would be you know so um at that point we decided to go check it out we started driving that way and while we were driving that way we got you know dispatched to a fire in a house on Cope brilliant and uh you know kind of figured that's what it was so i think by the time they had finished dispatching it we were pulling up to the house like that's how fast it was um on top of that, it was kind of like a perfect storm because I don't think we ever realized that there was other 
units that were out of service for training and whatnot. And so we were kind of alone at the moment on that side of the city, you know. Um, I remember, you know, leading off with Ben, we had a, a two story with heavy smoke on the second floor, heavy smoke and fire. And I remember leading off with Ben and going into it. And we had like put out a small fire on the first floor. It was just a little bit towards the back and there wasn't really even smoke on the first floor. You know, it was clear conditions were clear. And then we started making our way up to the second floor and, uh, that's, where the bulk of the fire was. I remember like dragging the hose, um, to get around, you know, they were one of the stairs that kind of had, you know, they go up, they have a platform, then they bend, they go up and then they have another platform, you know, the, of the second floor. And, uh, so I remember like, you know, being lying around that corner, that corner bend, um, I, you know, saw Ben step up onto the second floor saw him you know look right and then he looked left and he was spraying water you know hitting the fire and uh i mean at that point i remember like the roof just came down and the whole thing collapsed and uh because i was on the staircase i got pushed back down the stairs and uh so at that point, you know, I, I somehow the hose had whipped, whipped out from underneath it and had whipped back towards me. Well, I still had my hands on the hose, so it slid and I was able to get a grip on it and catch it, um, kind of got control. And all I could remember is kind of thinking like, where's Ben? And, uh, you know, I started screaming out his name kind of starting to panic, making my way back up through the rubble and stuff, you know, as far as I could. And, uh, I just kept thinking in my mind, I'm, I, I don't know why I just kept thinking like that he was, you know, kind of like Galen, like that he was just gonna, you know, kind of walk out of, you know, from a corner or walk out, of, you know, of somewhere and, you know, be okay. And, uh, that's that's not what happened and and you know so i was uh i was making my way up on top of the rubble and um i felt a tug on the hose and uh the hose started to melt off i remember like the hose line started to like melt in my hand um and somebody was pulling on it and I turned around and I looked and somebody was dragging the hose out, you know, and so I went out and, uh, I told, I was like, somebody's, you know, Ben's trapped under the, under, under the rubble, the roof collapsed and Ben's trapped. And, uh, you know, they, they, uh, at that point, I, I think they, we all kind of went into panic mode and, you know, tried to get them out from, from under the, the, the rubble. And I kept telling them, you know, where, where I thought he was. And, um, by the time they had found him, he wasn't at all where, where I saw him go down. He, I guess he had got pushed under the debris, you know, like when it had collapsed and, uh, I kind of, you know, just kind of like, I don't know, my, my whole, you know, I, I just kind of went into anxiety mode, you know, and I didn't really know what to think. And like, at that point I started to like shut down. Cause I, I knew, you know, I heard them say that, you know, at this point it was a, it wasn't, you know, it, it was not a, rescue it was a recovery and uh you know at that point they kind of escorted me down to an ambulance and uh you know we went to the hospital and i sat in the hospital until i saw um 
until I saw Galen again. And, uh, when I saw Galen, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we cried pretty good. We had a good cry and, uh, it was hard, man. It was hard. And then I, you know, I ended up going, um, Galen gave us a ride back to the station and I picked up my gear. I remember seeing like my mom and my, my wife, you know, at the hospital before Galen took us back. And, um, I don't know. I, I don't really, you know, it, it was kind of like your whole body kind of like your whole mind kind of shuts down. And, and it's like, I remember coming home that night and just kind of like staring, you know, and like, I was having like, really like intense flashbacks and, you know, uh, kind of like reliving like the whole thing over and over again. And that probably happened for at least a week and a half, probably, probably a little, a little more like two weeks, like just, and you know, it started to kind of like, it, it slowed down eventually, but it was like, it was pretty intense at first, you know, kind of like reliving it over and over again. And that's kind of like, I don't think till this day, I've really like, um, talked to many people about the situation or like, um, had discussions about it because, because I lived it so much in my, my mind, you know, over and over again, like, and what I could have done different or, you know, how I could have done it different or, what ifs and what it could is and should is, you know, and, and, um, you know, I miss them and, you know, so it was a hard thing. And it was like, you know, you go into, you go into this field, like initially, cause you say to yourself, like, you know, like all, all I want to do is help people, you know, that's like the whole point of it is, you know, to, help people and kind of, uh, you know, do what you can. And, uh, I, 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 I didn't feel much of, you know, like I helped anybody that day and, uh, and it really hurt. So, um, and so I went through some stuff after it and, you know, you know, yeah, that's, that's basically what happened that day. And so, I want to get April in on this. Um, you know, we talked about him being part of the family event, everybody vantage point. Galen touched on another point that I was going to make about, you know, the minutes and hours after and the difficult thing you got to do because when you, you know, things keep making it real. Like we go back to the firehouse, you got to move the car and you got to unpack the locker and you got to do all this stuff. That makes it more real that, this is permanent and he's not going to come back to do it. And, uh, and I always thought that was creepy. We lost people in the fire department before um, from the firehouse when Derek and Rob died, uh, those the squad had to go back and unpack two firefighters things, you know, at, at that point. So, you know, those are the little things you don't think about the first day back or reading a log and, there's going to be a long time before the log actually cycles out that he's not part of the log anymore. You know, so that just is little things, little things to pop up that you just don't even trip off of until it happens, you know. But I know um, uh, April has really been um, an advocate for healing. What, what got you even started going down this particular road of wanting to do something with your life, April? <laughs> Um, well, for me, it was, um, you know, being in law enforcement for 20 something years, you know, you just like every, every first responder, you see a lot. Um, and you know, you watch not only yourself, but other people, you know, your, your comrades around you change, uh, you go into this job one way, mid career, you're someone different. And by the time you retire out of it, you're someone different again. Um, you know, no matter what anyone says, you know, first responders, military, the, the job changes you, you know, and kind of depending on however you waver through it kind of depends on what side you come out on. Um, but what essentially made me start Rebound 911 was a very good friend of mine, um, Sergeant Brett Doolittle of Kansas City, Kansas Police Department, uh, died by suicide in April of 2015. Um, 
and he had been in law enforcement for 14 years, served a lot of specialized units. Um, I and others knew something wasn't right, but you know, we kind of thought he would be okay. Um, and we sort of just, none of us were therapists. None of us, you know, we didn't know what to do. Um, you know, you ask questions and you know, what, you know, you always hear I'm good. I'm fine. I'm good. You know, and you kind of just accept it, even though you're like, eh, I'm not real quite sure what's happening. Um, but you don't also at that time feel like it's your place to, you know, push. Right. <laughs> so you kind of just let things alone. Um, until I got that call, uh, that he had taken his life. Um, and he was one of the very few who actually left a note. And in his note, in part, it pretty much stated that um, the job was a good major contributing factor to his decision. And it was mainly because he had seen so much and had not learned how to properly process, you know, all of the things he had seen and all the things he had, you know, encountered. Um, and he didn't feel like he had a safe space or place to, to, to go and talk. Um, without, you know, cause again, in 2015 and even, you know, not long ago, even to this day, even though we're working extremely hard to try to reduce it, you know, stigmatization is still out there. Um, and like you said earlier, it's still taboo to many people in many departments and many agencies, no matter what industry it is. Um, but it really, I'll be honest, pissed me off. Um, I was angry because I, you know, partly blamed myself, even though I didn't know what to do, but I felt like, okay, something should have been done. Um, and you know, I felt like his department failed him, um, because everyone saw that something was wrong and nobody, everyone kind of just turned a blind eye, like, oh, he'll be fine. Um, and it kind of just made me look back and just realize that, you know, first responders in military, my dad was military. So I come, you know, I have tons of military family. So I kind of got it paired, you know, got it from both ends. Um, I, I see, you know, I've seen firsthand what this, what this occupation, whether you're a firefighter, police, whether you're dispatch, whether you're EMS, whether you're, you know, active military and or veteran, I've seen what these jobs do to you. Um, and it pretty much everyone's suffering in silence. And so because of fear of, you know, looking weak or fear of, you know, getting the right help or knowing what to do. They don't want anyone, you know, being concerned with, oh, are they, you know, are they okay? I'm not sure if I don't want to work with them or concerned about their job or concerned about getting promoted, you know, or their family. There's all these, these pieces to the puzzle. Um, and so a couple of, of, of good comrades of mine and I, you know, like I said, none of us were psychiatrists, none of us were therapists, but we were like, something's got to be done. Um, so we kind of collectively just said one day we were sitting around and said, you know what, we don't know what we're doing, but we want to at least create something to where, you know, our brothers and sisters, regardless of which badge they wear or what occupation they have, um, have a safe space and place to come to either just whether it be peer support, whether it, get, it is to get receipt resources, you know, whether it's a referral, um, you know, whether it's chaplain services, whether it's training, whatever it may be, we're going to figure it out, you know? Um, and so, you know, we did this, formed this in 2017 and we're still plugging away at it. Mm -hmm. So, thing. yeah, you do a lot of great work and uh, that, that selfishness is, um, cause it's one thing to talk about is nothing to do something about it. And you know, people, wait, wait till I get my PhD. Well, what can you do now is the question, you know? <laughs> Um, Kyle, what do you see? I know you know dealing with Galen, and God help you with that. But anyway, dealing with Galen, um, what do you see uh, as? I mean, I'm I'm assuming, but you can clear it up since you are in the military. Um, what are the similarities you see about what we're talking about? The stigma, the um, the putting more people before you, and then that is in essence eroding you which may lead you down some you know some dark paths that you might not end up helping anybody especially your family along the way and then your unique perspective of being a chaplain um what do you what do you what do you how do you help with that you know right so first that's a very good question and i i do want to lead off by saying um 
it's a uh, it's an honor for me to share this time with you as I listen to Devante and Tyler share their stories. Of course, Galen called me the day that all of this happened. And in many ways, I feel like I know you all because, of course, we never talk without him mentioning you all. Almost every conversation, you guys are a part of it. Um, and that shows me how much you mean to him. And that goes for you as well, Larry. I know how much you all mean to him. And... I really want to commend April for what she shared because I'll say this, um, just a quick, just to clear up a little misconception, I guess, about the army chaplain and I guess probably any service related chaplain, very little of what I actually get up and do every day is in the arena of religion. The overwhelming majority of what I do every single day is this, what we're doing right now, every single day. So, of course, chaplains, of course, even though we're religious leaders within the Army context, we are trained in a lot of different counseling modalities because the overwhelming majority of our work actually consists of journeying with soldiers and family members through these kinds of things. So when Galen, uh, when Galen first called and shared with me what had happened, um, I always try to differentiate between like which mode I should be operating in. Is he asking me in my professional capacity? Is he talking to me in my professional capacity? Am I just in big brother mode? And I guess these many years later, I guess it's kind of hard to distinguish, you know, the two. But um, so one of the first things I did ask though was whether or not, and listening to Tyler and, and listening to Devante share their story. So one of the one of the things, there's a lot of things just admittedly, and of course, I have to also state as a disclaimer, my views do not necessarily represent the views of the United States Army, of which I represent. They are mine. Um, but, you know, I've, I've been an Army chaplain for 20 years now, um, and, and I've had an opportunity, of course, to wade through far too many of these kinds of situations. So we have SOPs, the standard operating procedures that actually guide and inform the way we do this kind of debriefing and this kind of uh, this kind of processing work. So in the aftermath of experiencing uh, um, somebody out on the line actually dies, we come in contact, you know, uh, with troops, you know, enemy side or something. Somebody dies, whatever the whatever the means, you know, um, IED, you know, kinetic activity, whatever the case. When those troops come back off the line, chaplains, we immediately sit down with them when we do what's called a CISD, which is a critical incident stress debriefing. And what it looks like is exactly what you just did, Larry. What you just did is, in essence, a critical incident stress debriefing. You go around to each individual and you have them share from their vantage point exactly what happened. You don't attempt to jump in front of it, to course correct, to redirect them when they're sharing. You let them share from their unique perspective what has happened. You don't allow people to talk for other people. You don't necessarily allow other people to use other people's words, but you want to hear because what we're doing at that time is we're assessing, it's almost like a triage because then we have to figure out where we're going to redirect our energy, our effort, and our attention. Like we need, we know we need to go see PFC Smith. We know we need to go sit down with Specialist Johnson. We know we need to get behind closed doors with Sergeant Barkmeyer, something like that. You know, we are assessing exactly how much they have been impacted by what has happened. So that's the first level of what would be our SOP, our standard operating procedure, is we're going to conduct that SOP. And then the second thing would be for those who, of course, uh, directly impacted, we're going to generally, unless we actually are in a situation where, you know, we our, our, our manpower is so short that we just can't do it, we're going to give them a 48-hour stand down where they don't actually have to go back down to the line. Um, and within that 48 hours, there's going to be some counseling, there's going to be some observation. Um, but we do the best, we try to do the best that we can not to force it um, because you got to let people hold space for themselves and you got to allow them that space to process through what they've just experienced. So you you used the word a few times, uh, Larry, that I, I quite honestly, even these many years later, I try to wrap my mind around exactly what that means when we, we talk about normalizing. Because the reality is, even though this is what we do every day in our professions, there's nothing normal about this. 
There's nothing normal about it. Even though we know it's the hazards of the job, it comes with the job, the potential for this to happen is always present. We all understand that. And law enforcement, as first responders, as, as firefighters, as soldiers, we all understand that the potential always exists for something like this to happen. But just because that potential exists doesn't mean it's a normal occurrence, even though it might come with that profession. So when people are impacted by it, we go through this thing with ourselves where we tell ourselves how we should feel because I'm a soldier or because I'm a police officer or because I'm a firefighter or because I'm a first responder. We have these narratives that we actually tell ourselves that, well, basically, we know what comes with the job. We got to kind of switch gears real quick so we can get back out on the line and get back into action and get back to work, basically, because I shouldn't be affected in this way by this because it kind of comes with the job. We're going to feel what we're going to feel and we're going to think what we're going to think. And there's absolutely nothing we can do about it. And I'll take it a step further and say, quite honestly, in the immediate aftermath, there's nothing we should try to do about it. But think what we think and feel how we feel. If it's taking you out into a dark place, like where the self-blame kind of culminates in something like it's unfortunate what April has shared, because that's something that we're still trying to stem the tide on within the army is the survivor's guilt. And then on the other side of that, a soldier takes his life because of something he thinks or she thinks that they should have been able to prevent. Um, short of that, you know, people find themselves going down that dark path. You don't try to do a lot of course correcting and guiding. You want to give people the space to think what they think, feel what they feel, even as soldiers, even as firefighters, even as first responders, or more to the point, because you're a soldier, because you're a firefighter, we want to help people. That's the part we want to normalize. Like the thing we, we want to do our best to attempt to normalize is, hey, man, however you feel about what has happened is absolutely OK. As long as you don't want to get up and go take your life or take somebody else's life. Unless it's the enemy, I mean, with our profession, because that is quite honestly what we hope that, Lord, forgive me for saying it, but that's what we hope that it should lead to. It's just, it's, it's just stroke that fire for you to want to get up and get after it and go put something down on, on them that they put on us. You know, I'm just saying that's, that's how we, we, we do kind of encourage that kind of thinking, you know, but if it's, uh, if it's somebody that, um, if they want to hurt themselves, harm themselves, harm somebody else's self then we do have to kind of get involved and, and kind of walk them back in that kind of thinking. But for the most part, we want to make sure we give people the space to feel what they feel and think what they're thinking. So one of the things, of course, with my brother in particular, I, I let him fully vent because as you can imagine, there was a lot of things that he actually probably still showed us to this day, no matter what I say, because he was acting fire captain that day um, because you were actually down at the class and he didn't know he was going to get pulled into that class that day. So my day sitting in the seat, I get pulled away and then my guys get pulled out on a job. And then this thing happens. It would not have happened because I could have said, hey, this is, you know, you guys SOP. OK, we approach a, we, 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 you know, we approach a building and then these are the steps. I mean, if the hive of this thing is burning, this is what we do. Um, he sees that as his responsibility to make sure that his guys are properly prepared, trained and educated on this is what you do in order to avoid, you know, what happened that day. So I know that he still shoulders a lot of that. Um, and just just quite candidly, I don't know if there's anything that my words can't reach into that space. Only time kind of heals that, you yeah. know, we're really only two years removed from that happening. So um, it's going to take a while for all of you all to still journey with this. And I'll say that much. I know I probably wow, said good, a lot. Good, but, good um, stuff, good I'll, contribution. I'll, I'll, I'll and and just right to make sure we're clear about when I say normalize, I mean normalizing, being able to talk about it and normalize it, not being it being a thing to like, we don't talk about it or something's wrong with you or you don't have that safe space. Uh, we feel safe talking about everything else it seems like these days. But when it comes to stuff like this, then this is the kind of thing we want to kind of keep under wraps. But when you do that, it's killing you from the inside. And what sense does that make? So we want to normalize getting it out, you know, and that's what I want to talk about. Absolutely. In that right. regard, because it's, it's a, you know, or, uh, and and it wasn't just, you know, firefighters a lot of times not wanting to express themselves. The, the, the agency's attitude or the people you work with, they put that, that, that scarlet letter on you. 
And then all of a sudden you become the weak one, the one who can't take the pressure, the one that can't get over it. And nobody wants to work with you, you know, so, you know, and, and, so that, that, and that's, that becomes the thing. Go ahead, April. I was going to say, it's just the infamous suck it up, buttercup. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. You know, and that's, you know, that's the one of the things that I, you know, have always said has been one of the most detrimental things, um, you know, and and I say historically, you know, we, we didn't realize, you know, what we were doing when we were saying those things. Um, because obviously people are just stuffing, 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 you know, they're compartmentalizing, they're throwing in the back of their minds, you know, and then they develop vices in order to cope with it, mm. right? Which are unhealthy. Right. So they're drinking, they're using drugs, they're gambling, they're out here having, you know, just vicious, crazy sex. They're just, you know, cheating. They're doing all kinds of things to sort of compensate and hide really what's truly going on because they don't feel like it's, you know, okay to really say what they truly um, is experience what they're truly experiencing and how to really healthily cope with those things. Um, you know, one of the biggest things that we, you know, we are proponents of, you know, is, you know, is debriefings and coping, how teaching people how to cope after a critical incident, because it is, it is, it is crucial because that is a true making or breaking point, not only in someone's career, but in their, their personal life as well, because it ta- it changes you forever. You're never the same after that day, no matter what. Um, yes, you can heal, but you're still, you're still, you're now a healed, partially healed person. You're still never going to be able to go back to who you were before that moment. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, and so one of the biggest things, you know, I'm, I'm kind of famous for saying is, you know, everybody's heard the saying, you know, it's okay not to be okay. Um, which is very much true. But the piece that I add to that is it's okay not to be okay, but it's not okay to stay there. And that's where we have to really push each other to be, you know, there and be accountable and provide, you know, the resources that anyone needs. Um, And whether it be, like I said, peer support, whether it's chaplain services, whether it's a professional service referral to a mental health professional, whether it's a combination of thereof. um, That's why the continuation of care is so important. Um, You know, and kind of when you and Galen came to me about this, you know, my first experience really with firefighters um was when the uh blackjack i'm sorry the kinlock firefighters were shot in applebee's eating dinner um you know i got had not too long had met with that that firehouse and got to meet that crew and you know kind of that was my introduction sort of into firefighters other than working with them at a scene right um and it was not even 60 days after getting to know that firehouse that that company that their situation happened um, now fast forward, it's been three years since this situation happened because it happened June of 2020. We're still providing services to those firefighters. Um, you know, one, she can never come back. She unfortunately uh, will never be mental, mental capacity wise because she was shot in the head. Um, was, is it going to be able to return back to the job? And the other firefighter that she was with, Captain Meeks that she was with, he's returned back. Um, but he's still three years later, he has his challenges. Um, and he openly talks about it. And so that's where, you know, I really began to say, um, you know, we really, even though we're in different occupations, we're still for, we're still public servants and we all experience trauma. Um, It may look differently because of the way we function in that, in that critical incident or in that situation, in that scene. Um, But the trauma is still the same. Hmm. We're all still experiencing it. No, it just may look a little different because of our role that we played in it. Um, So, you know, I commend you all for talking about it because that's part of, you know, that's half the battle is most people don't want to talk. And I know sometimes, especially like you said, Larry, in the beginning, you're talked out because the people who weren't experiencing it and the people who sort of um, what I call from the outside, um, they don't really understand the additional uh, emotions that you have. Um, It's not, you know, we're not just coworkers. This is our family. Um, so this hits us as if it was our mother, our, you know, our blood brother, our blood sister, you know, our child. Um, it, it it is not something that you just, oh, a couple of weeks. Oh, I'm better. Oh, I can put the obituary to the side and I'm fine. No, that's not how it works. And especially, you know, with those that you were at ground zero, um, you know, like you said, survivor's guilt is, is real. It is very much real. Um, and so, you know, we have to be mindful of that and kind of, look at it differently. And so I commend you all for being willing to talk and, you know, and, and express because, you know, your, your story may help encourage and motivate 
or save someone else who's continuing to suffer in silence because they don't feel like it's safe hmm. to say, hey, you know, I need help. All right. No, you're right about that. And the reason it hits harder or hits different for firefighters, and I'm not trying to um, dismiss somebody who, you know, maybe work another profession where it's nine to five and you go home. I'm sure that that hits too based on your um, relationship. But with us, just it's inherent in what we do. We we eat together, we sleep together, we joke. Uh, when, uh, when 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 your kids, your kids, and my kids, I, I go over Galen's house. You know, I don't have the key to the house, but you know, basically, you know, I go over there you and it's like, it. yeah, I know, I get it. He knows. It, well, he got the key to my house. I'm gonna tell you that, but you know, like, like, I know he you know, right, right. You know, like, so, but I mean, that's how we are. And, and my go over there, you know, you know, the the girls, the Uncle Larry, you know, self Bella, she's a little too old for that now. To work. But the red, the twins, you know, like you know, like you know, she just be like, yeah, well. What's up? You know, but my point is, is that, you know, it's family, you know, Devante kids, Tyler's kids, you know, uh, uh, Danica, uh, uh, Salema and all, you know, we just, we know each other because when we come to work, we, we, uh, we bond in more ways than, you know, one, you know, and all the stuff that we know about being, you know, you share. So you sit around, you share, and it's those little intricacies that you share that build those relationships over time that you don't, realize you unconsciously are building <laughs> build that that foundation sets in then that part of the foundation gets ripped away so you're dealing with more than just a co-worker you're dealing with you know uh you know we know galen's dog name is luna you know i mean if i worked at you know somewhere else i'd be like i don't care what your dog name is you know uh, that's your, that's your business you know keep 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 your dog keep your dog out of my business you know but my point is um, but that's how we know each other. And when we know each other like that, and you take that part of it away, it's not as an easy recovery because the the new normals are different and the normals feel like, like you said, somebody in your house just died. When I used to tell people all the time, they say, you got, well, I worked a second job on the ambulance. And um, I used to always say, when I had to go work there, I got to go to work tomorrow. But whenever I go to the uh, to to the thirteens, I'll say, I gotta go to I'll be at the firehouse. I never really called it work. I'm gonna be at the firehouse. I'm going to a garage, I'm gonna hang out with about three of my best friends, and we're gonna go help people drive around in the cool fire truck and, and, and do some exciting things. And that's how I looked at it. Yeah, we gotta train, yeah, we gotta account for stuff, yeah, we gotta be responsible, yeah, we gotta do all that. It is work. It is serious. We need to take it serious. But at the end of the day, we are family going out to help other families. You know, uh, we got each other's back. I didn't. I didn't pull Galen now because Galen tends to be tunnel vision, gun ho sometimes. I'm like, hey, come back here, little fella. Let me. <laughs> we're we're not doing that right now. Let me let me let me check it out. You know, sometimes I had to be Devonte daddy. You know, because he'll do some dumb less than 30 years old uh uh kids stuff and i'd be like yeah come here for a minute we we need to talk you know and, you know yeah right, exactly you know and then you know like i said i had to get with tyler a few times like you know that uh come here for a minute so my point is that that's our family that, that's our family and um so when you starting to form that with your family and you form that and you know everybody's personality you know their business they know your business uh, David, my brother David, always laugh when we do our presentation. He say, uh, uh, Larry always says that we do everything together. If I got to go to Walgreens to get Q-tips, guess what? We all go to Walgreens to get Q-tips because that's that's what we got to do. Now, if you're at home, you say, Hey, honey, I'm running out to get Q-tips. Say, so, yeah, and bring me a ham sandwich while you're at it. You know, don't, your family don't operate as a unit at home, but at the firehouse. You operate as a, as a unit. Everywhere you go, we got to go as a unit because that's our readiness. We always got to be ready. So that's that's how it's supposed to operate. Lose a piece of that intimate, intricate part of the, 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 the system, and it hits different. It does require more recovery, if you will, than maybe, I don't know, if, I ain't going to name no names to some, some companies because 
I don't want to get in trouble with fire engineering, but uh, <laughs> but I'm just saying, you understand, anything outside of what we do in our profession, police, firefighters, military, you know. Mm -hmm. I'll say, actually, even for firefighters, if I can speak to that, Larry, uh, I made a comment. So not long after Galen got on, when he was at the 30s over at DeBolivar, and uh, I think I was at Fort Leonard Wood at the time. I was stationed at Fort Leonard Wood, so I wasn't at home, and I would get a chance to, when I would come to St. Louis, get a chance to hang out over at the engine house with him. And I remember leaving one time, and I, I remarked to one of my battle buddies, that what they act, what you guys experience within the fire services or in particular as firefighters, it's a more unique bond than even we have within the military. It's not like anything else you would probably find in any sector of society because we experience that when we have to go on a, we, we forge the same kind of bonds when we got to go into dangerous places and do difficult things for a year. And we're going to form those same bonds. But then we come back and then, like you say, we go back to our families mm -hmm. and we work together every day. But at that point, we're not living on top right, of each right, other right. anymore. You yeah. know, we kind of glad to not have that. I can go back. Yeah. I don't got to be around you. I can go back to my family now. But this is this is never not your life. And I think that the goodness in this is that it's almost kind of like a, a, a built in safety net within your community, though, that. If you guys actually have earned that right to speak into each other's lives, to do that kind of loving confrontation when necessary, to be able to check down, you know somebody well enough to know when they're really off, it seems like you guys got more of a system built in place to actually kind of catch some of these things before they get too far gone or too far out of hand because of how intimate your connections and your relations are by necessity of your profession and what you get up and do every day. It's more unique than anything. I mean, we eat our meals. We're going to go sit down at the defect, though. Y'all actually cook for one another. You know what I mean? It's it's like nothing else you'll find anyplace else in, in society, I think. And for that reason, I think that y'all got something built in there. There's some goodness that um, I think that y'all might even be able to explore. Kind of like, so one thing that April said that's key, like, I, you know, I have gone to school and learned to do a lot of these things, but I've learned enough to know this. You don't have to go to school to learn how to be a, to help somebody. You don't have to be, all you got to do is be empathetic and be in the moment with a person. And you can get a lot more distance in helping them kind of begin to unpack what they be struggling with than somebody with 19 degrees on their wall, because they know you understand. There's a lot of things that are inferred or implied that you don't even have to state. They know that you know because you live this together and you can go a lot further actually doing that sharing amongst one another than even trying to really bring a professional in the room. That's just my thought. You're right. No, you're right. I mean, people out here chasing degrees and I'm not going to front on too much because I am working my master's right now. But anyway, but yeah, yeah, yeah. But my point is to April's point, like you said, the only good degrees you need as a good person is 98.6 degree. That's all you need. And uh, if you got that, then everything else, the sky's the limit, you know. So you got to be warm enough to care. And that's what we uh, do. And that's what actually is a unique bond with all of us. We we uh, we help people. That's what we primarily do as a living. It might, somebody might start out like, oh, it's a good job. But at the end of the day, when you really fall in love with the job like all of us have, um, it's you, you there. I'm going to the 13th today. You don't even call it work because you're there to help people. Galen probably and 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 the rest Tyler and, and Devante can attest to this too. Galen probably heal more people than just medicine. So we call him Huggy Bear because he hugs everybody. You know, it's just like he's <laughs> like you're like, oh, I got a stomach ache, I got diarrhea. Okay, well, until the ambulance gets here, you know, just you know, we're like, hey man, you, know, <laughs> you you just you just didn't learn learn that part that part that part about personal space in school, did you? You know. And, he's uh, got so. the he's got the Narcan in his fair. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and then he knows I'm not a touchy feely. I'm just not. I'm just not that guy, you know. And uh, and so he he used to make be on purpose in the morning come in, and he almost chased me around the kitchen like I'm a hug. That's that's why I just said forget it. Let's just get it over with, you know. And just, you know get, he's get touching in. me. Yeah, he's, he's touching, touching me. me. Stop touching me, you know. <laughs> And you, and you still need to go clean the truck, so all oh, that ain't gonna work either, player. You know, but uh, 
but my point is you learn everybody or whatever galen um at work uh uh we made some special arrangements for galen i ain't gonna get into it because i don't want somebody to come uh, powers to be to come mess with you about it but we made some special arrangements for galen at work but the reason we did it because galen is the only boy at home so when he comes to work he gets to beat his chest i'm a man i'm a man you know and uh so we just let him be a man at work and allow his man space and that the engine house become one big man cave to him because when he gets home the, who run the world girls who run the world girls so <laughs> so so we let him come to work and you know and just he get to beat Poor his Galen. chest and he got a few little things we we do for him at work to make sure that his, his man card stays accurate you know and uh because otherwise if he didn't you know we, we don't know what would happen you know so he said he, when he bought the new house he tried to have a man cave this is now a player this the girl the, the whole house is the girl cave you know it's the craft so, room <laughs> <laughs> look you gotta right, show right. you something now okay see oh, <laughs> exactly <laughs> Right. I don't know if he if he didn't told you right, right. to that point. That was our that's right. our testimony. He got three, I had four, and we were going back and forth to see who was gonna have the first boy. So he had went through three girls. I got four girls, but then my son came along, so game over. <laughs> right, right, right. You got got you got them now, yeah. So I feel you. So, but my point is that's what we allow for each other you know with with the whole thing we able to let tyler be as creative as he want to be at work he he can express his creativity and as long as it don't fall outside the rule book i was the, i tried to be the kind of leader to just let everybody be the best of them and then bring that cohesion that synergy to the table you know uh, uh Devante, he got his u- unique perspective on things tried to be a player for a minute and then he shut that down you know so uh, but I'm just saying, he used to tell us like, oh, y'all don't know this, this, that new, new, this, how we do things. I'm like, man, come yeah, on, man. We it. just, we, we just retired players, but we, we, we recognize right. the game, you know, it, I don't think that changed how y'all say it, but the game ain't changed players. I don't think, you know, Look, yeah. game ain't changed. The only thing they've added is technology. Yeah, that's all. That's all. That's all. That's and, that's, and that's dangerous. I'm going to tell you, Kyle, I'm, I'm more and more Christian every day because this new world is scary. To be this easy <laughs> to do some of this debauchery, I don't want. I don't want a part of it. It's scary. Anything this easy can't be good for you. You know, I never thought I'd be. No, no, thank you. No, oh, you put this app. No, I'm not doing that. La, 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 you know, and I got the granddaughters now too. You know? So, but my point is that you know we all are family. That's the main point I'm trying to make. Um, like I said at the beginning, this is kind of the beginning of a series of things I want to do. We have more uh, people on, more experts. There are definitely people that are more clinical and, and smarter than I am who I want to eventually incorporate. Uh, this is all part of also some of what my brother and David do when we go around and teach, talking about personal leadership. This falls under the umbrella of, of adding this that personal leadership and personal responsibility to take care of you so you can take care of the citizen. Because a lot of times we done fell into that paradigm of, I don't care about myself, I'm just here for the citizen. Where if yourself is depleted, you're not bringing your A game to the table and you're not gonna be able to help anybody. So we gotta take care of ourselves mentally, spiritually, physically, and uh, socially. And when we cover those on a regular basis, then we can bring our A game to the table. But I wanted to kind of kind of start to wrap things up with number one as April kind of walk us through these resources like you, you know, and I know we're trying to, April and I are working on some things behind the scenes right now to try to uh, bridge the gap and make it one big public servant um, 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 service solution, so to speak, for all of us because suicide is one of the number one ways that we end up dealing with things that we can't comprehend anymore. It's, it's, we either do slow suicide, as April alluded to, with our bad habits that can kill us, or at least you'll be in the living hell with what you created, or they do it acutely. And we've had more suicides than I want to count just, just based on 
the stress of not managing our, our best selves well. So I want to talk about like, um, you know, just briefly tell us like somebody's feel like the end of the rope. They give you a call. What happens then? You know, that kind of deal. And then I want to, after we talk about that, um, the resources, uh, we'll, we'll kind of touch on the continued healing that we all are doing. And then I just really want to end on a high note on some, if you got a cool Ben moment, you know, just kind of, you know, share that. And I uh, said, so it doesn't end too solemn. And I, I didn't want to make this a, 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 a joking thing because this subject is not a joke, but you know, we all firefighters and we always going to put levity to stuff, no matter what you do with it, you know, this, and that's a coping mechanism. I can't tell you how many times we get back in the truck and be like, Ugh. You know, and everybody's quiet for a minute, and then somebody cracks a sick joke. It's not to be, um, it's not to be insensitive, but did you just see that? <laughs> so instead of maybe saying it like that, and uh, but I ain't gonna tell you, so there's some sick stuff that that might end the podcast by saying it. So I'm not going to say that, but you know, I think the most innocent thing I could share is like one time I first came on the job. And this lady, uh, she, she, we put a fire out, but we couldn't find one of her cats. So she loved my guys. She was real close with her cats, and she was crying. And, oh. So I called myself trying to fit in. So, so I'm standing on the porch, and I say, did anybody find the cat? I said, no, we're going to go back and look. I said, well, you know, if we don't find this cat, it, it could be a, a catastrophe, you know. And uh, so she heard me. <laughs> and she like, oh my God, you're so insensitive. <laughs> I'm like, hey, guess who crawled all through the yard through cat shit, everything? I, I was going to find that cat because I was trying to keep my new job, you know. And we ended up finding the cat hiding in the backyard. I'm like, that's the only thing that saved it because I know good and well we had found that cat or that cat ended up dead. This cat wouldn't have had a job for real, you know. So I was like, but my point is, that's where you go. That's where you go with stuff, and you got to be careful and, and, and sensitive and all that kind of stuff with it, you know. But April, I'm at the end yeah. of my rope, and, and, and I don't know what to do. And I, I'm looking through my stuff, and I'm, oh, man, this, this, this woman, April, seemed pretty intelligent, gave me a card. I, I guess I'll give her a card. What, what, how does it look? How, how does it look after that happens? I mean, I get the call, and, you know, I'm going to figure out really what's going on. I'm going to let them talk. Um, see, you know, like you said, let them fit, see what they're going to tell me. Uh, in that process, I'm essentially triaging them, figuring out whether this is somebody who just really just needs a peer support, um, you know, or is it somebody who I knew need to get them connected with the mental health professional? Do I need to do it now? Is this a situation where I need to, you know, locate where they are? Do I need to get them in, in basically into my custody, get them to the hospital to write an affidavit for them to get put on, a, you know, a 72 hour hold for an evaluation to be done? Um, is this somebody who, you know, OK, yep, I can work. I can deal with them on a peer support level. Uh, you know, do I need to bring in our chaplain? Because uh, this may be something that, you know, they are needing that uh, that religious perspective as well. Um, and then also with the same time working to find the most appropriate mental health professional, because that's the other thing, um, depending on what's going on with this individual is going to determine, you know, who I'm going to pair them with, whether it be the peer support person or whether it be the, um, chaplain and whether it be the mental health professional, because really depending on this person, what their needs are, um, you know, you've got to match people because that's one of the mistakes that we make is we'll say, oh, we'll just send them to this person. Well, you know, if this person doesn't necessarily really fit the bill for the, what this person needs, they're going to go. It's not they're not going to be a good match. They're not going to work. And now I got to fight like hell to get them back to be willing to even attempt to go to talk to someone else ever again um, because it was such an epic failure. So, you know, being being there and really, like I said, figuring out what's going on with this individual is going to be the first step finding out what do they need. Um, I mean, we've, we've gotten to the point now where, a lot, you know, some, several are very familiar with us, you know, they'll call and just shoot the breeze and I'll be like, Hey, okay, what's up? You know, Hey, do you want me to, where are you at? Um, and they'll, they're okay with me rolling up on them now um, and just figuring out what's going on. And a lot of times they just want to talk, you know, they, they just want to say what's been going on or what's kind of bugging at them um, or, and it may not even be anything 
that's mental health related. It may be something that's job related, right? They're just trying to figure out the best resource. Um, and so we are able to match them up with what, what to help circumvent it escalating to something worse. Um, so that's essentially, and if it's someone that's even out of our, out of our, what I call our service area here in St. Louis, you know, I will get them connected as quickly as I can to somebody in their area, um, to be able to figure out how to best serve them. So we do our best as quickly as we can to, to really figure out what the person needs. I mean, I've been called out at two in the morning, um, by a, a trooper's wife who did not know me. Um, she had gotten my name from somebody and was like, Hey, I'm really concerned about my husband. He's out in the garage. Um, he doesn't look well, he hasn't been acting himself and I'm very, I'm very concerned, but I don't want to call 911. I don't want to call his command, um, because I'm afraid of what may happen with his job. And I'm like, okay, so what do I do? You know, myself and another team member, we get up at, and it's one 30 in the morning and we're heading to rural Missouri. Now, do you know the other problem with that is I'm not gonna lie. This man does not know me. I'm going to rural Missouri. Um, he may not be, you know, he may be a little scrap like chocolate, you're right. Chocolate chip dip is rolling up and he, he, he might make me, you know, that might make things a little nervous. Um, but I mean, it's, it's to that point where, you know, it doesn't matter who you are, where you are or what's happening. If we get that call, we're going to respond, whether it be in person or getting somebody to you. If we're not within what I say, arms or, or foot's length reach, we're going to do my best to get somebody to you. Hmm. Um, so that's sort of how the process works. Okay, good stuff. So uh, get, give us uh, some contact information so um, those who are watching can, uh, uh, if you know somebody or whatever, can uh, uh, contact you and or uh, web, web page, website or something like that. Let's see. Our website is a rebound 911 uh, stl.org. Our, our phone number is 314-292-9334. Um, and you can also reach us on Facebook, um, Instagram, uh, Twitter, TikTok, or excuse me, X now, I'm sorry, <laughs> um, or uh, TikTok, uh, send us a message and, you know, we'll reply. Mm -hmm. Good deal. Yeah, we want to, we want those resources out there and we want people to um, know there is help out there and there's a strong initiative these days more than ever to get the word out, get the help out and just just reach out. There's no shame in the game. Um, and I'm, I'm still starting and not finishing as well as I should as far as my healing. And that's in full transparency, but I'm moving in that direction because I do understand that it's very necessary. And, and, and sometimes what I'm chiseling away is that I've always been the go-to person in a lot of things. You know, I'm the firstborn, so I'm the oldest and, um, the, when I was at work, I was the, the leader at work. And then uh, me and Galen do the burn camp. And so I'm the camp director at burn camp. And, you know, so you always find yourself in these number one positions. And when you're in the number one positions a lot, hey, when you're in one in number one positions a lot, uh, you feel like, well, I don't really have time to fall back and take a break because I got to serve, you know, take care of business. But I'm theoretically not doing what I'm saying that needs to be done uh, when I'm identifying it with the job, you know, so it's with everything. So I appreciate the uh, help and I appreciate the talks we done had um, to um, to help even get on this trajectory of helping people even better. Uh, one thing Kyle said, and I know me and Tyler kind of touched on this when we talked a few weeks ago, is that there needs to be a debriefing SOP for organization, a strong one that says, uh, not like, oh, so what do you want to do? Or, or uh, 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 there's help out there. Or here's the famous one you take it, captain says, everything is rubber stamp. Uh, do you need help? Yeah, EAP, and then we're done, you know? And so that's not, you know, and that's why I like what April does. She said, let me, let me get more into the weeds and see how we customize something to truly help you instead of rubber stamping you with, well, we check, he, they say you need the help, so we check the, uh, that the EAP box, okay, check. All right, you should be good when you come back to work, you know, so it shouldn't be um, that that way. The standardization should be more of a comprehensive 
SOP because even if it never happens, and God forbid, hopefully it never does, but it only takes that one time. And then when somebody does uh, do something more drastic as a result, then now everybody comes out the woodwork about what should have been done and what we need to do. And all of a sudden we find money and resources and, and, and there is SOP. So why do we always have to react to a tragedy before we start doing uh, what needs to be done? Because the bad thing about public servants, whether you're a firefighter or you're a cop or you're in the military, it ain't if somebody's going to die. It's just when. We got we just had some guys on the helicopter get killed out in the San Diego, um, I think, today. You know, well, that's, that's going to be some debriefing that has to be done for that unit, their families and things. So it's not. So, so we already know this could potentially happen. The likelihood of it happening is, is great. Then why not put something comprehensive together for your department? Well, and the other thing too is, you know, on top of that is, you know, I always, you know, some agencies sometimes have been a little resistant to us. Um, and I, and I have to explain to them, we're not here to replace anything that your agency, your company, or your department offers. We are here as a separate supplement, right? And we're here as an additional resource because, you know, let's just admit it. People have concerns about using sometimes, you know, EAP. People have concerns about using anything that's company related because of fear that whatever resource they exercise is going to be found out about. Um, somehow it's going to get back. So, you know, I tell people, if, you know, this is the other reason why we're here is if someone does not feel comfortable utilizing the resources that their, uh, their department or agency offers, and you have some departments that are small that don't even have resources to offer. So we're here to sort of fill the gap for those that don't have anything or those who do not feel comfortable or safe using what their department offers. Um, because at the end of the day, I don't care what resource you use. I just want some you exercising and taking and getting usage of a resource so that you get help. Right. I don't care where it comes from. Right. Um, cause that's all to me that matters. And so that's where we kind of work together. Um, you know, especially as more critical incidents are unfortunately happening and more debriefings are having to happen and more things are, you know, requiring our attention that sort of also too, where we collaborate with different agencies and saying, look, you know, yes, you've got part of your pro, already part of your department policy is you call in this group of people. Well, here's the deal. That's great. But if your men and women don't feel comfortable talking to them or don't want to talk to them, I don't want them not getting help because they don't want to talk to whoever you provided as a resource. Right. At least allow them to know that there's someone else there um, mm -hmm. that can be able to at least even if I connect them right back to the resource that you'd offer, that's fine. I may have to breathe that bridge because they may want to, and I've had to do this. Um, I've literally had to go in, sit in with somebody on their, on a first session because they were too scared to go. Mm -hmm. Literally had to hold their hand, drive them there and go in, get them in. And then I was able to back my way out, right. but that's what we have to do. Sure. And I don't, that, that's just part of the job as far as I'm concerned. Right. Um, and, and, and having those things in place. So you're right. It, it's important and we shouldn't be reactive at this point because it's happened too many times already. Sure. We should already have something in place. Right. Now, good stuff. I'm, well, I'm glad you're a resource. I'm glad that we got you to call on. Um, she's an honorary 13th member anyway. So, you know, we should oh, yeah, be I'm coming to eat, by the way, because I'm yeah. hungry. Me too. Yeah, I've been there. I, saw, <laughs> I saw some steaks there on social media and I didn't, I didn't get the invite. But, what, you know, what are you I, making, Galen? Uh, Right, right. Pork chops. <laughs> yeah, make my pork chops. Galen, Galen can make some pork chops. You know, what, what, what did you make that time that wasn't that good? I don't forget about that one. <laughs> oh, he knows exactly what that is. <laughs> right, right. Tell, tell it him, wasn't Galen. that bad. Hey, it wasn't that bad. Yeah. What was it? Yeah, it wasn't good either. <laughs> it, was, it was like a, it was like a, uh, it was like a pineapple chicken uh, dish. Oh, like it, yeah, yeah, yeah. He out there on the looking at Pinterest trying to experiment. Hey, man, we just need to base it down in the hood. That's all we need. Pork chops and applesauce. We're good, hey, you know. Yeah, hey, you remember? <laughs> you remember Ben's pork steaks? <laughs> they were pork crackers. He he had I overcooked was them. Those those yeah. pork steaks spent forty nights and forty days in the desert and <laughs> came out. As pork crackers, right? They, they, they're like they taste like something that should have been in the bag that you get from the corner store. Like you know, like 
pork steak crackling or something. They looked, they started like this big, and then when they came out, they were like this big. They were <laughs> like, like ben, little yeah, bitty. What is, yeah, what is this? You know, so yeah. that's a Tyler's funny story. You got one, Devante? Funny uh, not, story. <laughs> not, not at the moment. Not. Yeah, you was in the academy with him, wasn't you? Oh yeah, oh yeah. You saw him when he did it when he debuted the Crip Walk in the Academy. He's like, what? Yeah, well, you know. Yeah, it shocked a lot of people. Yeah, so sure did. <laughs> I mean, this because Ben was kind of a quirky nerd, you know, like he real smart, real look at things, you know. He like, man, I never thought about going to that atmosphere, but man blown, brother. They they think for their perspective, you know. So, well, he got his cool kid points that. Day. Yeah, yeah, but then he 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 could, he could sit up there and quote Shakespeare. But then break out with the Snoop Dogg on you, you know. You're like, man, you got range, brother. This brother had range. You know? so, right. look, we love that, you know. Galen, what you got? You got anything? Uh, my my uh my favorite memory was uh that day I gave him his uh, frontispiece. That smile on his face was just priceless. Yeah. You gave him what? A frontispiece. It, it, it's it's frontispiece. Oh, oh I thought you said 13. something else. Good God. Okay, I'm sorry. It's a family show, April. He didn't say that. <laughs> Hey man! <laughs> For God's sake, the twins are running around the camera. Are you want hey, that's why I had to clarify because I'm like, oh, what? Hey, 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 hey. Okay, I'm sorry. Continue. I'm, on. I'm, I'm wondering what the heck you think I said. Yeah, no, hey, don't, 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 what does uh, front of piece sound like? <laughs> hey, hey. All I heard was text him. Text him. Text him. Text, text him. <laughs> hey, I'm about to do like with my mother's on the show. I'm getting ready to say something. That she'd be like, she'd be like, mm-mm, 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 don't, don't. We'll talk about it over yeah, 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 right, right. Well, it's pork, too. Next time Galen cook pork chops, you know. No, don't have no pork. No, I forget. You don't do the pork, you know. But anyway, give her something else. Give her some, give her some pineapples, you know. There we go. <laughs> April, April, you can come on when Tyler, when Tyler makes his uh, Mongolian beef. That's, that's another firehouse favorite. Ooh. Oh yeah, yeah, that's a good. One. Tyler, yeah. G- uh, Galen, I don't know why you're talking right now. <laughs> mute Galen. <laughs> Put the mute button okay, on. So now I'm gonna have to call ahead, get the roster. <laughs> right, right, right. Figure out what's going on. And Devante, yeah, right. Devante can throw down too. Don't let. Yeah, Devante where's the mac and Devante. cheese, Devante? Devante can throw down too. You know, yeah. I'm famous for burning stuff. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. It. Because the night I was there, you, yeah, you jacked some stuff up. That yeah, night. tell him. He did that on purpose. No, he did that on purpose. Yeah. He did that on purpose. Yeah. Yeah. Did that and on then purpose. I, I used to always and cheat. Everybody knows it. I used to always cheat when my uh, when the times I did take, because I don't even cook here at home. Uh, people come over my house and look at my stove and say, why do you even have a stove here? I said, well, it was the space that the stove was supposed to be in, you know. But I might put the entertainment center there because I don't use it. But uh, Bob was always cheating how Jessica come up and cook, so you know. So. Look, Uncle Larry could microwave a mean soup. That's all I got. <laughs> at the end of the day, <laughs> we all you could, you could microwave a mean Sal- Salisbury <laughs> steak. <That's- laughs> hey, we all got we all we all got our, our things, you know. Um, any, uh, we we're gonna close out with some parting words and. Uh, and this has been great. Thank you guys for sharing. Um, I think it's a continued part of all of our healing as uh, not on the individual, but as a, as a unit. Um, I'm not there anymore as the, as the captain, but I still feel like we family and um, we still, you know, when um, they have stuff or we all show up, we still show up and show out for each other. So that's cool. And um, let's um, continue to heal. And and this don't have to be the last time. Maybe we check in in the future and just see where everybody is, see how we're doing, and and continue to heal. Because I I don't think it's a thing like, are you healed? Yeah, okay, good. Got that out the way. Let's let's move on to the next episode. That's that's not how the human dynamic works, you know. So let's continue to heal and be a light, and hopefully this show can help somebody because um, for people who've been through it. And then, unfortunately, people who are going to have yet to go through it, uh, maybe this can help uh, let them know that there is a light at the end of the tunnel, at least to help you continue to be functional and serve your families and still do your job and all. You know. um, got any parting words, April for us? You're the guest of honor. Um, no, I mean, I'm, like, I've enjoy- I'm glad that we are 
you know, again, getting thing, the word out, um, cause awareness is, is, you know, our number one friend, um, and, and letting people know that there is resources and that, you know, you, and many of the words is just, I'll put it this way. Most resources, particularly even with our organization and others out there that are seminars, you know, you are, it's all confidential. Um, so, you know, the one thing I always say, you know, now that I don't work for the city anymore, um, uh, I, I, they don't pay my paycheck. Um, so I am not, I'm not obligated to report. I, I am not a, no longer a mandated reporter for the city or the state minus the only time I would be is if you were to threaten harms to yourself or someone else, that would be the only time. Um, but minus that, uh, you know, you are in a safe space and place. And I encourage anybody, you know, even if you just have questions, um, are you, you know, even if you want to call and say, I've got a friend, that's okay. Be the friend, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, to get the information. So, right. but thank you for allowing us me at the time. And I'm, you know, <laughs> 13, here I come. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, Tyler, you got anything? Pardon words. I just think, you know, like, uh, you know, I think what you do is great. The, the, you know, helping first responders and, and people like that, that's awesome. And I think that, you know, more people should, um, reach out. Like if you're not feeling good, if you're not feeling good mentally, if you're not feeling good, you know, just in general, just reach out. Cause like, I think it's really hard for us to do. We tend to normalize things. We tend to like um, put it in the back of our heads and let it, you know, kind of fester into things that it shouldn't be, you know, and and that's where you kind of get into trouble. And I think that um, we take care of everybody except ourselves really is what it comes down to. And, and, and that's, you know, not, not good. It's not good for anybody. It's not good for the people who you treat. It's not good for your family and it's not good for you, you know? And I think, uh oh, and I think that, you know, um, I think that we need to start, you know, making mental health like more of an issue. I think that that's important. And, and, and I've been through it. I've been there, you know, I've hurt till I can't hurt anymore and gone through, you know, the worst of it. And I think that the best thing you can do is kind of see like a positive side to things and try to work your way out of that hole and see what you can do to help, you know, others, you know? So that's kind of why, like, you know, we all came on the show tonight, like Galen and, and Devante and, you know, I can't speak for the others, but I'm sure is to help people, you know, and, and that's all we want to do is, you know, make sure that there is um, a way to do that, that there's, there's a way to do that. And then I also think that when things like this happen, there should be, protocols in place, um, you know, that, that are there to help those that don't even know they're going through something, you know what I mean? And, um, yeah, there's times like, I felt like, you know, I was fine and I wasn't okay. And, and I think that, you know, it's the people around you that recognize it and help you get through it. And, you know, if I didn't have Galen and I didn't have you, and I didn't have Devante and, and, you know, I think that it would have been so much harder than it was kind of going through that, um, you know, those, it was really hard for me. And, and I think that I had the strongest support system anybody could possibly have, you know what I mean? As far as family and friends go, I don't think that that will be the case for every single person who goes through something like this. And I think that that's why it's important that we establish a safety net and, and something that we can fall back on or, or, you know, so, some do something, you know what I mean? I don't sure. want to just sit around and watch somebody else go, go through what I had to go through. And then what Galen had to go through or Devante and, and, you know, suffer in silence. And I don't think that we should suffer in silence, you know? I think that um, a lot of people go through stuff and there's a lot of people out there that are going through stuff right now who you can talk to that are going through the same thing as you, you know, and they don't even have to be therapists or this or that. You know what I mean? They can just be humans and you can talk to them and right. get, you know what I mean? So sure. mm -hmm. and that's what right. I got to say about it. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, not a day goes by that we don't think of Ben. We, you know, we all love Ben and and miss them and and so 
you know, thank you for having me on the show. Thank you for having, you know, the 13s and, and getting a chance to talk about it. Yeah. I appreciate you, brother. Yeah. Um, Colonel Taylor, you got anything? You know. Go ahead. So first of all, again, I want to thank you guys for uh, allowing me to come into this space and be a part of this conversation. And honestly, Larry, my whole thought is that um, this turns into the equivalent of a uh, Cat Williams episode <laughs> of Club Shay Shay. And if this is going, this is going to blow up in a way where April winds up getting right, a million right. dollar hey, grant. Hey. I can hey. retire from the army in three right, years. Right. Come work with you. Come back home, right. in St. Louis, because you have shined a light on something and actually invited people into a conversation that you realize is critical, it's important, and it's needed. And um, it's just like giving people permission to talk about something that everybody knows is a pervasive problem, but we don't actually do enough to really kind of, you know, facilitate the discussions in the right way for people to understand the importance of creating safe spaces for our people that are working in these professions to have a way to kind of offload this stuff that we all carry. So that's sincerely my hope for that this actually gets the level of exposure that April's work can get the level of exposure that again, the city will see the critical need for it. They give her a grant and so she can build out her program and she can do even more to help people. Um, just know that I pray for you all every day as I pray for my brothers, you go out to save lives and protect property. My thoughts and prayers always go with you and your families. I pray for Ben and I pray for his family because I know their hearts are still heavy as I know your hearts are still heavy on the other side of this. So uh, again, I'm just glad to have been a part of this discussion and I'm excited to see what this might open up as far as uh, right. what direction this Appreciate might go. Appreciate your input, so, brother. Appreciate it. Galen, did we, we, did we say something to you already? We, we got the one tail of it. No, I just, yeah, no, I want to I uh, say thank you to my brother, first and foremost, always being there for me since I was a little, little guy. Uh, thank you to April for stepping <laughs> since. in and helping us. <laughs> a little, since, you know. since a little guy, what are you talking about? <laughs> Shut up. Cal, Cal, Cal didn't do a good job there. <laughs> no, go ahead. I'm sorry. That, that's another thing that the family does. We can't, we can't do it, but go ahead. <laughs> He's sitting on a phone me. book right now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you to April for stepping Aww. in when she did and coming around as often as she did and making sure we were okay. Um, thank you, Chief. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you, Devontae, for holding us together. That was that was critical. That was very critical. Uh, publicly apologize to my wife for pushing her away in the beginning and not, you know, recognizing you know what i was going through uh but yeah uh for you senior guys listening to this out there it's uh very important uh i can tell you uh a life-changing event for us at one of our uh debriefing uh meetings was two of the senior guys in the room who are known to be tough as nails known to be like no nonsense guys barely talked when they opened up about some things that they had experienced over their careers that was like it was like the clouds cleared and the sun came out for a lot of the junior guys and they so they 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 immediately felt like now they were in that safe space it's okay to talk i mean this guy's talking i've never heard him say anything in my life he's talking it's okay for me to talk and uh, we started seeing more guys open up. And uh, so I just want to say that to any senior guys listening to this show. You know, uh, you might be that that integral part of helping somebody, you know. So take advantage of that. Be helpful. And first and foremost, help yourself. Because if you don't help yourself, you can't help others. True that. Anything, Devontae? He's still there. Devontae has left the building. Right, Devontae, like, peace. Somebody just, you know, Devontae, the young one, probably passed his bedtime. He's probably drinking his warm milk right now and twisting. <laughs> Puts the wall on this twisty so he can go to bed. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but anyway, but we appreciate your contribution and your uh, vantage point earlier and uh, talking about, you know, since you were there. Um, anyway, thank you all for agreeing to be on the show. 
thank you for talking about a difficult subject. It's not easy. Uh, like I said, I had a little anxiety. I was thinking like, you know, I should call and say, you know what? I got a ton of homework. Let's, let's do this another time. Yeah, but you can't just keep kicking this down the road. And, and I'm glad we're doing it now because, like I said, during the heat of when things were uh, really, you know, around the time when uh, Ben's death happened, it was just a, it was a lot going on. So I'm glad that we were able to. I think we're in a better space now to talk about it than we would have been then. And I think this is a great part of the healing. But the healing continues. And uh, so anyway, thank you, uh, April, for being our guest. And uh, thank you for the the form of people we will we'll get together and do it another time um, and, um, and and see where we are. Maybe by that time the, the grant be done kicked in, she get three million, we all could quit and go work for April and, and help people, you hey. know, in other ways, you know. <laughs> but uh we'll we'll work it out. That's anyway, cool. yeah. But anyway, we got another show coming up in another seven weeks. Tune in, gonna be some more great guests. Um possibly Mama Elaine and David will be back. Uh, but anyway, we got a whole, got to buy a decade worth of podcasts. You can catch up on until then. So check us out on Fire Engineering. If you go pull us up and uh, pull up Fire Engineering, the website, and go to podcasts, uh, somewhere in there, a, a picture of me and my brother pops up. So uh, I think one of the cool pictures that Galen took a long time ago, he still got that up there. So uh, so we, uh, we we all over Fire Engineering. We got FDIC coming up in April. And uh, so possibly this will be one of the topics that we talk about when we go live from FDIC. So be sure to check that out April 15th through the 20th. Um, and then David and I check our website out at www.glutenationldc.com to see where we at in the world. We just got back from Winter Fire School in Missouri. That was a great time. Always a good time. We always call that kind of the prequel for FDIC because a lot of the FDIC the fire department's instructor conference um, greats come there to teach, and then we see each other at FDIC and and have a great time then. So, um, and uh, and this is going to be the first year that David Rhodes um, is 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 all his this year. It's all David, so uh, it's going to be great. And uh, ever since the passing of uh, our dear friend Bobby Halton, so uh, so we're looking forward to a great time. David's very smart, very clinical. And we know it's going to be a, a, a great show this year in Indianapolis in April. So, uh, but outside of that, be safe. Uh, talk about this stuff. You got April's information. And, um, but if you, you want to use hers, use somebody's information to help you uh, continue to be better. Because if you can't help yourself, you can't help others. That's just the bottom line. So, um, uh, until next time. Uh, Stay safe, and uh, we'll talk to you later. Breathing in diesel exhaust fumes is like walking into a fire without a mask. Over time, those toxins lead to cancer. Protect yourself with MagnaGrip, the easiest, most reliable exhaust removal system that features a true 100% seal to eliminate diesel exhaust fumes. To get free grant assistance, visit MagnaGrip.com. IFSTA is dedicated to advancing firefighting techniques and safety through the creation of our manuals, instructor resources, and student study materials. Our high-quality, technically accurate, and affordable training content has made us a fire service leader. Visit us at IFSTA.org for more information.